Welcome to another edition of Around the Table with Stacey Smith as we take a look at the political scene. Elections are always compared to horse races, and if that analogy is to be used, then they have just rounded the final turn and are now just a few furlongs away from the finish line. And depending on which race you analyze, it would appear that in one statewide race, one candidate has a solid lead. And in the other statewide race, it would appear to be going down to a photo finish by the candidates. So I've asked my panel of political analysts to place their bets a week out from the election, and it's now time to find out what they think. The panelists are former governor of Pennsylvania, Republican Tom Corbett. Mr. Corbett also served as a state attorney general for the state of Pennsylvania and also the U.S. attorney for the Western District of Pennsylvania. Mr. Corbett teaches law at Duquesne University and also practices law here in the city of Pittsburgh. Jim Byrne is the uh, former chairman of the state Democratic Party, but he's now the chairman emeritus of the Democratic Party in Pennsylvania. Jim also served as president of the Allegheny County Council, also mayor of Millvale, and Jim is an attorney in town. As we go around the table, we find Keith Schmidt. Keith's background goes back to the Reagan presidency and his delving into politics. And Keith was the state director for former Republican Senator Rick Santorum for the state of Pennsylvania. Also, he was a consultant to Santorum's 2012 presidential bid. Mr. Uh, uh, Keith, uh, it's Mr. Really? Keith Schmidt, has a uh, consulting firm of his own right now. And seated across the table on the Democratic side is someone who I like to call the great philosopher of around the table, Joe Mystic. Joe is a guiding light for a lot of Democrats and has consulted on campaigns across the state. He also served in several roles in city government, including that as deputy mayor. Joe teaches law right now at Duquesne University, and you can read his thoughts on life and politics in the trip. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being with us, including you, Mr. Keith Schmidt. I appreciate yes, you being you. here with us today. So yes, sir. let's start with what is believed to be the easiest race to call. Governor Corbett, you once occupied the governor's mansion in Harrisburg. Now, who is going to occupy that mansion come January? Well, uh, I'll go back eight years ago. You can't wait for this week to get over if you're the candidate. And, and I'm sure that um, Attorney General Shapiro feels the same way. I would say he's going to uh, make it easily. If he were to lose it, it would, in my opinion, be the greatest upset in recent memory. Anybody yes, want to jump uh, in? Yeah, I, I, I agree, uh, Governor. I remember uh, you know, eight years ago, you wait for that final week. Uh, and and, and you know, by then, you know, the, the die are cast, you get to election night and whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Uh, I don't know if you recall, sir, but the night of the election, I bumped into you over at the Carlton. Uh, I was in Pittsburgh, and I think you were out for dinner, and I was, I was there as well. Whatever was going to happen was going to happen, and we had a very pleasant you know, exchange and a talk. And I think everybody that was there in that moment felt relieved that within a few hours we would know the result one way or the other. And I think both sides are getting to that point. But having said that, the principals are looking forward to this to be over. Uh, the campaign staffs are as well. But it would be the upset of the century. Uh, for governor. Josh has been planning for this for years. Uh, and 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 he put a team of of some of the best in the state and in the country around him. Uh, he organized. and and the amazing thing is when 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 we were running against the governor in fourteen, we had a crowded field in the primary. We had four candidates. Uh, we weren't able to unify behind one. Uh, Josh was able to clear the field in an unprecedented fashion. So we didn't have a contested primary. We didn't have any, any uh, pun intended, loose chads hanging around that the Republicans could use against us in the fall. There were no, no sound bites from an opponent that could be used against the general uh, election candidate. So all those things being said, plus the division we saw in the GOP in this race, it was hard for them to come back together around the candidate that is considered flawed by many, even in his own party. I, I would be shocked, gentlemen, if, if if the Shapiro race wasn't called within five minutes after 8 p.m. next Tuesday. Well, the problems that you folks had in 2014, obviously we had. I think we lack real leadership in the Republican Party in Pennsylvania right now, and I hope that's addressed uh, forthwith and, and, and we see some change in the years to come. But right now we had a field of, at one time, 12 candidates. It dwindled the uh, to 11. I think we ended up going to the, to the election day with eight. Uh, and we ended up getting a, a fringe candidate, an ultra conservative that has inability to raise money and will come up short on election day. The frustrating thing is I think we squandered a huge opportunity. I don't believe that Josh Shapiro is a populist. I saw him 
I saw him take two weeks to win an election that no one ever lost re-election to as attorney general to a virtual unknown here in Western Pennsylvania to be declared the winner. I suggest, and I meant, said many times on this program, that he, they cleared the field because all the good Democrats thought it was a Republican year. It was a two-term Democrat. It was a midterm for an unpopular president. Let Josh run. Well, timing is everything. Now Josh has handily outspent his opponent, outworked his opponent, and will now be the next governor of Pennsylvania. I think Josh probably would have been our gubernatorial candidate under any circumstance. It's a natural progression to ask Governor Corbett uh, from state attorney. Not, not natural. I was the first one that did it. Well, it's natural after you then. Okay, okay. You, you plowed the road. You, you but, plowed uh, the road. I, and I think he would have been... Uh, it would have been easily to have to have gone extreme against the extreme positions that, that uh, Mastriano had been taking, but he kept a middle of the road, steady as she goes kind of campaign. He's been steady and even throughout this thing, and and it's really to his credit. And I think that's the key to to a uh, to to what should be an impressive victory uh, in in a year that uh, you know Democrats often have to struggle in. Well, let me ask this mainly for you, Joe and Jim, if Keith is right. And if the Republicans had nominated someone else other than Mastriano, perhaps someone who was more uh, in the middle of the road, if we can call it that, in, in, as far as politics go these days, uh, would Shapiro still be this heavily favored? No, I would say it could be. I mean, hypothetically, it would most likely be a closer race. Uh, uh, when you have someone as extreme as Mastriano, we've not seen anybody like that at the head of a ticket, a statewide ticket. It's really pretty unbelievable. Uh, some of the positions he's taken he's he's not even tipped his hat to to uh uh to people near the, near the middle uh you know he's stayed he stayed far right throughout the whole thing and and that's hard to explain hard to understand but it would have been a different race indeed i i agree with joe you know we've talked often and we'll continue to talk about the red shirt blue shirt the numbers of the red shirt blue shirt are very close it's when we get to the independents and most people don't realize this we have 1.3 million people registered to another party or listed themselves as independent. And I think with a, a, a different kind of candidate that appealed more to the middle than Mr. Mastriano does, uh, this race would be close. And some of that has to do with eight years of a Democrat governor, the midterms, as people have talked about, it would be a much closer race than it is today. Now, let me comment on that one more time, though, but I, on, on what the governor just said. Uh, He's convinced me, Governor Corbett has convinced me that we should allow independents to pick what party they want to vote for in the primary election. I think that will be the key to the future. And you won't see Doug Mastriano's heading up the ticket of a major party in the future if that happens. It's a major consideration right now. Uh, if if independents and, and non-affiliates were allowed to vote in this uh, primary, I suspect that the Republicans would have had a different nominee. Uh, and and, and is there and, and if they would have cleared the field a little bit more earlier, I am convinced they would have had a different nominee. Uh, that is a conversation being had in both parties right now about whether or not to open the primary. And many folks in both parties who I never thought I would hear them say it uh, are now saying we need to significantly consider the possibility of an open primary. I think that would have changed the narrative. And I think you know, uh, if you're getting extreme candidates on either side winning, then they have to run to the middle and the general and the opposite side uses that to contradict them. You'll start to see less of that. And, and, and if this is something that we are going to do, uh, then I think what will happen is you talk about that 20 yard line to midfield where people just want to get good government and get good deals and move the ball down the field. Those candidates will start to make a comeback. You query whether or not uh, uh, some of the moderate Republicans or Democrats who did great things uh, would win in a primary today. All right, Oxygen we, is the fuel of any race, especially when it's the fifth largest state in the union. And the fact that by estimates, he's been outspent 10 to 1 with coordinated maybe 20 to 1, it's hard to put your arms around the fact that it's even at all competitive. I mean, this race is a lot tighter than any of us could imagine. And for that reason, I would think that if he had oxygen uh, and he had more money, this could be dangerously close. Somebody like a fringe candidate like this, uh, an ultra conservative is is competing right now in a state that he shouldn't compete in, especially with the fact like that I think the National Governors Association, the Republican, for the first time in our lifetime, did not engage in Pennsylvania. I mean, Pennsylvania is the keystone state. They've always played here. They decided not to play here this year. So you'd have to scratch your head and wonder 
if Mastriano did have more of a bankroll, would this race be interesting? And and uh, that would, in my opinion, would be unfortunate because even as a Republican, he's not the face that I want to see represent Pennsylvania. All right, we do have to take a break. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Around the Table with Stacey Smith. We are talking about politics. The election is next Tuesday, so we're talking about who might win and who might lose in this upcoming election. So, Joe, your thoughts on the national perspective. Will Nancy Pelosi still be speaker next year? And who is going to have control of Congress and why? Well, if I were advising Speaker Pelosi today, I'd tell her to walk away from this mess after what happened to her husband in San Francisco. Uh, you know, it, it's a it's a terrible image of American government for the world to see uh, when when hate speech foments this kind of these kinds of violent acts. Now, uh, if if we were to hang on to the House, would she stay um, after this? Uh, I, I would suggest to her that she shouldn't uh, because she's given enough to the nation. Uh, but uh, she may decide to stay for one more term and keep us on track through the rest of, uh, uh, you know, through the rest of this uh, next couple of years. But it, it's, you know, um, uh, it's going to be a tough decision for her. So you're you are predicting the Dems are going to have control of the House? No, no, I'm saying oh. if we were to still have control of the House. If you were to still have control of the yeah, House. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very close. Okay. I think with the narrowest of margins, I think they're up by nine votes. I mean, you look at midterms when the opposing party's in control, what happens? Often it's uh, sometimes as many as 50 or 60 or 60 seats at switch. I would say at least uh, the Republicans are going to look for a gain of, of north of 10 and probably closer to something between 20 and 30. They need this. They literally are down nine seats. So a swing of five. So uh, the House is gone. As much as we I'll agree on the, the prognosis at the top of the ticket in, in Pennsylvania for the gubernatorial race. I think even Mr. Byrne would agree that the House would be a tough nut for the Democrats right now to maintain control in this atmosphere. Yeah, Jim, the, the uh, latest real clear politics estimate, and it's all estimates, nobody knows for sure, is that the GOP at a minimum will have 228 seats, the uh, Democrats 207. They're really projecting about 233 for the Republicans and 202 for the uh, Democrats. Anything's possible. I mean, that, that's, you know, pick a poll that fits your narrative. And, you know, uh, somebody could pick another poll and say the one, one of the ones that I looked at, and I apologize for not having the name of it, but it was 10 seats that are in play, really in play. And, and all 10, all 10 appear to be advantage GOP, but the GOP isn't popping the champagne yet because there are variables in each of those 10 that could, if the right alignment takes place in the next seven days, all break the other way. Uh, so they should pick up enough seats to take control. It should have been a slam dunk to do it. It isn't. And it isn't for a lot of reasons. And we've covered them. You know, start with the Supreme Court. Start with the radicalization of the GOP. Start with QAnon. Start with Mr. Trump, who every time he shows his face, he reminds the Democrats what they have to do. Uh, so a, a lot of variables have made it not a slam dunk for them. They should, but I'm not going to fall off my chair if the Democrats hold serve. Uh, I don't think they'll pick up, but it's not impossible, which is amazing to even say that in a midterm. It's not impossible because last time it happened, Keith, I think was in 82 when Reagan was at the height of his power. I don't think we've seen a, the, the house with the, the party with the White House hold serve since then. So amaz it's amazing in this dynamic, in this climate, we're even having that conversation. Well, but God bless you for having that narrative, but it's going to be a long night for you on Tuesday. And I we'll would see. make this observation when you talk about when Reagan was there and they held serve, he was a popular president at that time. Mm -hmm. Right now, President Biden is not a popular president. His numbers are you know, down in the low 40s. So I think it's going to be hard for them to even come close to holding. I go with the numbers that uh, Stacy commented on. I saw similar numbers this morning. Uh, it could be as many as 2021 20, seats switch. Stacy, we're losing you. Uh, here Can't we hear you, Stacey. Yeah, now we go. Uh, also, I find very interesting is that the uh, uh, Republican Party is starting to put money into what are traditionally solid Democratic congressional districts uh, to, uh, just to challenge them and, and making the making the Democrats spend money where they really don't want to. That's a typical ploy by both sides. 
is try to make the other side spend money. If you've got a little extra money and you know it gets a little redundant to put it into the same campaign, let's see if we can't create a little mischief over in the other side and make them spend money. We did that. I mean, we did that at the state level. Uh, you know, we did the 67 county strategy. We knew we weren't going to win Tioga or, or, or Franklin or Potter or McKean, but we went in there and, and we invested uh, and, and we helped as much as we could. Uh, and so we tried to close the margins, but then your opponent is opening up a front they weren't expecting to open and they have to spend resources and it can divert monies from the coordinated campaign into areas they're not supposed to go. Uh, so no, I mean, what, what you're mentioning, Stacey, as the governor alluded to, uh, it's not something new out of a playbook. Uh, oftentimes, both sides will do that to throw a curveball at the opposition. But you can only do it if you're flush with cash. So the good news for Republicans is the NRCC is flush with cash. And you never do it if you're not confident about the outcome, because you have to hold. First of all, you have to win before you ever go into questionable seats. You have to be pretty doggone confident that you're going to already have the majority to take that type of risk. So I think those tea leaves really favor a big Republican win on if, the eighth. If, if you're talking about being flush with cash, I heard a commentary on the way in here to uh, Duquesne today that um, uh, in, in 14, the number was like uh, $5.7 billion spent on campaigning across the United States. And now today for this election, it's $9.4 billion being spent. So there's a lot of cash out there um, all being reported, I assume, but a lot of cash out there to be spent on campaigns. We have to take a break, and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Around the Table with Stacey Smith. We're talking politics in the upcoming election and who might win and who might just lose. Jim, let's stay on the national level here for a second. The Senate, of course, is critical for the Democrats to at least maintain a 50-50 split, a split with a deciding vote by the vice president. So who will have control of the Senate in January? I suspect the Democrats are, are still the party that will hold serve in that regard. Uh, Pennsylvania got close, as we know. I still maintain that, that Fetterman will, will squeak this out. Uh, Ohio is interesting. Uh, I, I think Ohio has a great chance uh, you know, to, to stay, you know, be in the, in the Democratic column. Keep an eye down on Florida. Marco Rubio has a fight that he had not anticipated. I know many of the polls are showing enough of a margin for him to be uh, victorious in the end. But he's in for the fight of his life down there against a very qualified candidate. But, but having said all that, again, there's just too much of a hill for the Republicans to climb on, on the Senate side. I suspect it could get as close as 50-50, which is a win for the Ds with the vice president breaking the tie. But I think it'll be more like 51 or 52 uh, on the blue side. The House, we've already talked about that. But uh, I, I, I do think that the Senate is still for the Democrats uh, to lose. I don't think that will happen. So you are predicting the Democrats will pick up a seat or two? It's it will, I will not. Again, I said this a couple of times. I won't fall off my chair if they do. It is not outside the realm of possibility that they do that. Well, I have to say that, uh, you know, with these 35 races in the United States Senate, I have to agree with my colleagues. It's, it's going to be a photo finish. Uh, there's a lot a lot of very close races within the margin of error. The only reason I feel encouraged that we will uh, uh, establish a new majority for Republicans in the United States Senate is those issues that are pulling late in the campaign, I think all favor the GOP. The economy, inflation, crime, and a poor Southern border. They change all the time. These weren't necessarily the issues coming out of our primary uh, back in, in May. But in the last two polling in, in October, these were the top of the list, and all those favor Republicans. And that's why I give the advantage to Republicans in taking over the United States Senate in six days. Well, we can't forget about mail-in voting uh, yet again. Uh, it's early voting. Uh, and then by the night of the uh, Oz-Fetterman debate, uh, at least 48 percent, maybe as high as 70 percent of the mail-in vote had been cast. Uh, some of it was still per residing at the post office, probably not yet in the elections department. Uh, I think that vote favors Fetterman, and I think it's often that way across the country. So it depends on how, how much that early vote got in and when it got in. Now, the issues did change. Republicans scored some points on crime because they, they like those fear tactics, and that does scare people. And, and, I'm not, and, and that's even a, a legitimate fear. Uh, but uh, 
uh, I still think it's advantage Democrats. We're going to hang on to the Senate. Uh, uh, you bring up the fear factor. I, I have to counter with just saying that that uh, ever since I can remember following elections, Republicans were going to cut Social Security or do away with it as well. So, I mean, the, the well, fear factor to- works both ways. They've tried a few times, and thank God for us old guys, they weren't successful. <laughs> but, you know, let's go back to that fear factor and and, and talking about crime. Uh, crime's an issue, and I think um, uh, subliminally to a lot of people, we're seeing more crime on TV here in the western part of the state, uh, more shootings on a regular basis than we did 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. I don't know how that's going to affect the voters. Uh, when they go in there, I suspect that you know if they if they think the crime is a problem, they're going to go to the Republican side when they start voting. If if an exit polling, it, it, we see that if, if if the R's have a good night, and one of the reasons they have a good night is because voters felt as if the R's were better on the issue of crime. Uh, I'll share my thoughts with you know studying the film at that time on on what happened in that regard and what should have. Uh, been done differently. I know that these are doing their best to push back on that narrative uh, that they are not the party to go or that they're not the party to, to keep us safe. They're fighting hard on that issue. Uh, but if, yeah, again, hypothetically, if it breaks for the R's on that issue, there will be plenty to talk about on that on a subsequent show. Sure. All right. Go ahead. All right. I was just going to throw this out to just for uh, fodder here, and that is the uh, going back to the real clear politics averages and how they're making their predictions now and because of underweighting the GOP in previous elections the real clear politics is now kind of predicting that the GOP will have pick up four seats it'll be a 54 to 46 majority for the GOP in the Senate hmm. well they're that's even surprising for me I that's, that's actually more they, than I thought I thought yeah. I thought the high water mark would be three but uh, I can tell you after this broadcast, I'm going to look up that poll and see uh, and see what they're talking about. Well, it's not the really only poll counts is election night. I mean, you know, these the polling business itself is suffering. They they don't even know how to get a good sample these days. So I I always get a kick out of out of uh, what we're doing here when people say who's going to win. We're going to know in a few days. Right. But it's fun to talk about it. I mean, that's, yeah, that's it is fun. <laughs> yeah. well, we, we wouldn't have a show if we couldn't talk. About exactly. It. Hey. Thanks, Let me throw in one more thing that just absolutely is the Supreme Court, Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision, yeah. making it clear that ballots that get mailed in, if they don't have a date on it, they have to put that ballot aside and sequester it, and they can't put it into the count at that point in time. Uh, I think that that decision of giving certainty uh, to all 67 counties in Pennsylvania might calm down the rhetoric that we would see otherwise uh, and that we saw two years ago. Hopefully that's yeah, it. It might, Governor. And, and you know, it's it's not a lot of votes. No. Uh, you know, it's a few thousand votes maybe, which can make a difference in a local race, a tight race. Uh, mm. But, you know, it, it was 3-3 in front of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court with the unfortunate tragic passing of, of uh, Chief Justice Max Baer. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I... If it settles people down, I'm sort of okay with that. Yes. Yeah, and I, I think that is is absolutely needed after that, uh, what happened in 2020. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Around the Table with Stacey Smith. We are talking about the elections, the upcoming election on Tuesday, who's going to win, who's going to lose. So, Keith, I saved one of the most hotly contested races in the country for you to give your opinion first. Who wins the Senate race in Pennsylvania, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman or Dr. Mehmet Oz, and why? Well, in my lifetime, the Republicans have enjoyed tremendous success in the United States Senate in Pennsylvania, notwithstanding uh, Bob Casey's uh, big win in, in 2006 when uh, it was a second term for George W. and the, the Democrats swept the nation. Uh, he would be the asterisk. But other than that, we've enjoyed a lot of success. But even though we've enjoyed a lot of success, the, in the same period of time, I saw Democrats always have big leads coming out of the primary. And maybe that's related to the fact that they have a large registration advantage. They're not paying attention to Republicans at the time because they're not making decisions on them. But they always start with big leads, and then they dwindle. And then they tighten. Because over the summer and into the fall, 
you find out the good, the bad, and the ugly about both candidates. And I always say an educated voter is our best customer. So I think over time, as they got to know both candidates for the good, the bad, and the ugly, I think the advantage and the momentum has switched dramatically to, to Mr. Oz, or excuse me, Dr. Oz. Uh, and dramatically because, listen, it's a tough state. It's, it's a purple state at best. In some cases, you could look at the numbers and think that we're starting to turn blue. But I still believe the momentum is with him. I think people have got educated. They've become comfortable with his positions. And I believe he's going to win by two or three points. And that's a huge win in Pennsylvania in 2022. Yeah, we're truly a purple state. And, and uh, I suspect that it will be close. But uh, I still uh, look to the mail-in uh, voting that occurred pre-debate. And I believe that that will give the advantage to Fetterman. I think it will too. Uh, we we've talked about the coordinated campaigns, and, and and Josh Shapiro not having a primary was able to start to put a coordinated campaign together statewide for the Democrats. And and for your viewers, a coordinated campaign is when all the candidates that are on the ballot that year statewide they all chip in, they all chip into one pot, uh, so to speak. Uh, and uh, so for every dollar I spend on a coordinated campaign, I'm I'm saving four dollars, give or take. Uh, because we're all rowing in the same direction. I'm not walking up one side of the street with my literature and seeing Professor Mystic on the other side with his. Uh, the D's and Josh in the state party have done a remarkable remarkable job. This is one of the best looking coordinated campaigns I've seen the Pennsylvania Democratic Party do in a while. It's really impressive. Uh, and, and because of that- one, Let me add one thing. Uh, I think there's going to be a pretty substantial undervote in this race mm -hmm. because neither of these candidates uh, uh, is appealing to a whole lot of people. I mean, there are a lot of people out there that aren't going to vote for either one. And so you'll see far less votes cast in this race than you will for the governor's race. Which speaks to, I think, respectfully speaks to my narrative of a better coordinated campaign. Yeah, yeah you will have an undervote. You'll have more of an undervote if you don't have a good coordinated campaign. Because what does a coordinated campaign do? Identifies the voter that you need to flip or to convince to be for you. Okay, you find them. You get them on your side. You maintain that relationship and you make sure they vote. That's the four criteria of a coordinated campaign. And the state party in the coordinated right now is doing that better than no other. So there will be an undervote, I agree. But that coordinated campaign advantage will allow Fetterman to hold serve, I think. Well, I think that if, if this polling is anywhere close to being right, the numbers, most recent one I heard from uh, the Muhlenberg poll was it's basically a dead heat 1% uh, difference. That's amazing considering the registration advantage that they had, that the Democrats have, uh, considering the performance of Shapiro uh, as the uh, governor candidate. And does he have the coattails that will bring Fetterman along? Uh, but I will go back to this. I think two things, uh, the performance uh, at the debate raised concerns to voters uh, on behalf of uh, Mr. Fetterman. And secondly, I go back to crime and the Republicans have been hitting him on the crime issue. If people are really concerned about crime as much as I think they they are, uh, it's going to be a very close race. And I don't think we're going to know the numbers and the winner until sometime on Wednesday afternoon. Before I make my closing comment, I want to say I think somebody offered Jim Byrne a thousand dollars for every time he says hold serve. Uh, so I think because he said hold serve now at least five times in this broadcast. So so he's five thousand dollars richer. Just know that. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, and he's buying dinner. Race, I, I still remember, listen, I I've said this a million times, this is a million and one. Pennsylvania is one of the biggest ticket splitting states in the country. Top five has been for 50 years. We've all agreed that the Republicans are going to lose the governor's mansion. So as a result, I think that's another part of the narrative and part of the equation that, that gives an advantage to Dr. Oz on Tuesday. I'm going to quote one more time from Real Clear Politics, just so you guys understand where how they're coming up with this. They've taken polls from, from recent history, and they've figured out what the actual numbers were that came in on election night. The polls have been 2.6 percentage points undervaluing the Republican vote. So Fetterman right now has a 47.4 average. Oz, 46.2. That's 1.2 points in favor of uh, Mr. Fetterman. Uh, I'm sorry, the underweight for the GOP is 3.8 points. The Real Clear Politics is now predicting that Oz will win by 2.6 points.
based on the undervalued, underweight of previous polls. Maybe the pollsters have figured it out and there is no underweight this time, but we'll see. That is why they play the game. Yeah. <laughs> it's a sport. It's the, it's the most popular sport in America. Indeed it is. As I said, it's a horse race and we're coming right down the final few furlongs to go. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being uh, with us today on a, Around the Table. Uh, we're going to uh, be back all together on election night uh, to uh, on, on the CBS in Pittsburgh, uh, CBS News Pittsburgh, uh, to give our analysis of what is happening that night and to give the latest election numbers. And we hope that you join us again on that night and also for the next edition of Around the Table. Thanks for joining us. Thanks.